Hi, good morning. This is Melanie Fenwick Thompson. I am here with Wait One Legal Minute. And this is a platform to discuss legal issues or social issues, just bring information to the general public, to colleagues, and just a, a place to exchange um, information, commentary, opinions. Um, today, I have with me Jamie Tear. And she, hello, Jamie. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm great. How are you all this morning? I am well. I'm well. We also have Jabrina Johnson. We have her audio. Can you hear me, Jabrina? I can hear you. Wonderful. And I hope that we're able to get you, your video on before the end of the show. Right now, we are having just some technical difficulties, as usual. It would not be a wait one little <laughs> minute. <laughs> moment if there wasn't some technical difficulty and it is this is in lieu of several practice runs with all my guests every time prior to having a show so we're just going to keep things um rolling um yes and i have a comment already that they see jamie but not jabrina but they can hear you jabrina so the listeners the viewers can hear you okay um, so we're going to go right in if you are considering divorce or separation, this is the conversation for you. We're going to hit on three different topics today uh, in a very short period of time. So this is for a person who is, or for people who are considering uh, divorce, legal separation, or um, just trying to understand what exactly is marital property and considering what they should do in terms of divorce or legal separation. So the first topic that we're going to talk about, I did a video, I posted a video last Thursday about um, the cost of divorce. I did that because there are so, there's so much concern when people hire you about the cost of divorce. I personally bill hourly, which means the person pays a retainer and then I charge them hourly based on my rate and they get an invoice every month. They sometimes have to replenish that retainer. And that's normally when some of the frustration um, comes about. Jamie, what has been your experience? Um, first of all, do you bill hourly or do you bill a flat rate for your domestic matters? Well, it really depends for me on whether or not I'm doing hourly or flat rate. If it's an uncontested matter, then I do flat rate. If it's a contested matter, then I do hourly. Okay. And do you find that clients, when you charge hourly, they get frustrated with the cost because you can't really set a price? Well, in my experience, and I've been doing this since 1998, I usually try to, um, at, at the front end, tell them how much time I think their case is going to take so that we can eliminate some of that frustration when it's time to replenish the retainer. So I try to be up front, as upfront as possible on the front end so that in the middle, when I say it's time to replenish your retainer, then they're not as frustrated. So typically I require at least a 10 to 20 hour retainer up front. And then I tell them, especially in domestic situations, it's really just going to depend on the parties as far as how expensive it's going to get. So if you all are agreeable, we go through mediation and we're able to resolve it and it's going to be less expensive. But if you aren't agreeable, we got a lot of discovery to do, then it's going to cost you a whole lot more money. So I tell them up front that it's really going to depend on the parties. I try to make sure that they clearly understand that it's very likely they're going to have to pay more money to eliminate some of that frustration midway. Jabrina, what has been your experience with uh, the level of frustration with the cost in your domestic um, matters? Um, so I think I would agree with Jamie. Um, people always say, well, how long is this going to take? And I tell them there's really not a way for me to give you an answer to that, because clearly um, if you want something that's easy, simple, hey, I don't really want to fight. You can't control if the other person wants to. So while we may be able to stay on task, if we can have something that, that kind of rolls pretty easily, um, that is not necessarily how it's going to go if the other person you know wants that fight so to answer your question uh-oh i think she went out 
Can you still hear? I think she dropped because our screens went too. Okay, I apologize for that. Sabrina, can you repeat the last statement? And now when we see you, we're gonna join you. Let's hide you. You did something different. Sabrina, I think- Oh, there you are. Hold on. You switched devices on us, yay. <laughs> I did. I just got on my cell phone. So now I can see you guys. Now we can see your beautiful face. <laughs> so everyone, this is the, the, the face of the voice you were listening to moments ago. Um, Jabrina, I hate to have you repeat, but just the last part of what you said, um, can you just repeat that now that people can see your face and hear you at the same time? Absolutely. Um, I was just saying. One second. You have an echo. I believe you have another device or something that's on. So you have an echo in your sound. You know what? Go ahead without me and let me figure that out. We'll come okay. back. Okay. We're going to come back to Jabrina. I'm going to mute her out. Um, again, this would not be um, wait one legal minute fashion to have a live without a glitch. So we're going to uh, keep on. So still talking about the cost of divorce, uh, Jamie, um, how difficult is it um, for you to have that conversation with clients when it's time for them to replenish their retainers if it's been exhausted? Oh, you know, I mean, it's a very <laughs> difficult conversation, no matter how you prepare them for that conversation, you know, money tight for everybody. Emotions are high during a divorce. So when it's time to have that conversation, then it's to, it, it can be a difficult conversation. But I really believe that if you properly um, prepare them in the beginning of the consultation for that time, and if you're billing them um, every month, then they understand what's going on in their case, how much is left in their retainer, so that when it's time to replenish it, then they're ready as every month they're getting a bill showing how much is left in their retainer. So I think the key to that, as in all situations with clients, is communication. Communication and setting the expectations, like you said earlier. Um, and I try to do that in my consultation so that we're always on the same page. I, I think that, as you said earlier, I try to outline to my clients or potential clients, you, the litigants, drive the, up the cost of divorce. If you are calling me three and four times a day, asking sometimes the same questions and then sending me emails asking the same questions, yes, this is eating at your retainer um, because for every call, for every email, for every conversation, for every Thing that we do, you're going to get billed for it. That's how we are paid. Um, yeah. So I think for me, um, like you said, you try to, to set those those the, the level of expectation to be on the same page. Um, and normally after that first invoice, because the, like in the beginning, the emotions are really high. After they get the first invoice to see, oh, they are they really do charge me for every call. I got charged thirteen fifty when I sent that email. Or it was sixty seven fifty for that telephone call. Right, right. Then it kind of sits in, like, oh, they really do keep track uh -huh. of every call and email and so forth. So that is, and then and like you said, um, it's just about trying to stay on, manage the expectations and staying on the same page. I hope Jabrina is able to um, get back onto this call. Um, but in the meantime, um, how often do you bill your clients that are on retainer? I generally send out monthly retainers so that, again, there are no surprises. How often do you bill your clients that, have, that you bill hourly and have retainers? Well, I like to say monthly, but if any of my clients are watching, they're saying that's a lie. <laughs> well, that's real. We get busy. We're attorneys and we also are running practices. <laughs> but, but ideally, it would be monthly. Honestly, um, you know, I have moved sort of away from domestic and I do mostly estate planning and probate now. So even from a probate perspective with the billing, I again try to do monthly 
filling. So domestic, probate, whatever it is, whenever I'm doing an hourly retainer, the idea is to get that bill out monthly. And that just helps the client understand how much money they have left in their retainer and sort of get their pockets ready and they have to replenish it. Jabrina has rejoined us. Jabrina, I'm going to add you to the screen. You are coming on now and we're going to go back to this uh, view. Thank you again for joining us, Jabrina. The question I just asked Jamie and I'll ask to you, how often do you bill your clients? Are you Do you bill hourly or I'm sorry, do you bill monthly or quarterly? How often do you bill your clients? Try to. It's advantageous uh, for me to attempt to bill monthly. Uh, sometimes that does not happen, unfortunately, and it does end up kind of being quarterly. Um, mm -hmm. But I am definitely working toward I would love to be able to bill clients on the first and the 15th, you know, just like maybe they get their other bills um, just so that there's clearly an expectation and it's clear. Um, but that's just something I'm working on within my own office. And I have another uh, attorney that looks like she's on our, our comments. She said, yes, ma'am. Miss um, Garner, do you bill um, our do you bill hourly or do you bill flat fee? And while she's going to respond to that question, I'm going to go on uh, to do you bill any flat fee uh, rates for your domestic matters, Jabrina? Only if it's an uncontested divorce. Um, otherwise, we just have no idea how everything's going to go. Um, and actually, in my retainer, I'll put in there that if it changes from uncontested to contested, because um, sometimes people, you know, have expectations that it'll be uncontested Absolutely. and that changes so that we still continue to bill hourly when we start. Um, we just won't go over and above if it ends up being uncontested. But if it ends up being contested, then, you know, we will have already started on the hourly uh, rate because things change day by day. So that's the only thing that I'll be a flat fee for. Well, no, there are a couple of other things that fall in the domestic realm that can be billed flat fee, like name changes. That's still a domestic um, issue. And I bill flat fee for that. Um, mm -hmm. So it just depends on. It's, I think that what comes to our mind initially is the uncontested divorce, but there are a couple other things where a flat fee um, might be the right way to go, like a name change. A name change, um, or sometimes I charge um, a flat fee for a temporary protective order because oh, yes, me too. it's yes. not a long matter. It can mm -hmm. be resolved fairly quickly. Um, so you two both sometimes bill um a flat fee rate person on own. the tpo yeah. yes and listeners and viewers, legitimation sometimes when the people live together i've had a couple situations where the people were living together and they wanted to do the legitimation because they needed to i mean the father's rights still needed to be protected and they both recognized that and they and not just the father's right, the child's rights, you know, and then something happened to the father. So I've had situations where I had uh, a mom and dad come to me and they wanted to do a legitimation and it was truly uncontested. So those were also billed um, flat fee. But as Ms. Johnson stated, what we usually do is, um, or in all of my contracts, it says in the event that this matter becomes contested and it actually says the attorney determines whether or not it becomes contested, then it will go over to an hourly fee. Yes. And one thing that I re-emphasize in my video that was posted last Thursday about specifically this issue, the cost of divorce, it um, says, ask your attorney how much your divorce is going to cost, which they won't probably be able to give you or guarantee, but you should ask the question. Mm -hmm. And then um, I said they need to constantly review their invoices and make sure they're receiving them so that you can stay on the same page. And I think that keeps the, the expectations um, in check, in line, and everybody um, fully aware of what's going on, how the money is spent, um, and what else is going to be needed to finish your case. I have a few more questions, um, but before I go to those, I'm going to talk about the engagement letter as well. 
Uh, viewers, if you're thinking about considering divorce or any kind of legal matter, make sure you get an engagement letter from your attorney so you understand the terms of their representation, what you are to expect from them and what you have to do and that they expect from you. It is a two way street. Um, so please make sure you do get an engagement letter uh, and ask questions about the engagement letter so you understand the terms of the uh, engagement as well as the cost. I include in my engagement letter also, um, ladies, do you do this as well? Third party costs. They don't come out of our attorney's fees. Third party costs are monies that we may receive on behalf of a client to send out to a third, to, a, to, to another person, the court reporter. Do you all specify that in your engagement letters as well? I specify that in my contract. Um, and so we go over that at the initial consultation, that third party cost comes is separate from attorney's fees. And I also have them pay um, some upfront or advanced third party costs in anticipation of, addition of those costs. So I explain it at the time that they sign up and I also require that they pay an advance towards those third party costs. And so I'm a little different. Um, Sometimes clients do not have my full retainer. And so in order to make it more advantageous for them to pay the retainer in full, I will let them know if they pay the retainer in full, we will pay the filing fee, um, which is often required, or the service fee out of the full retainer. But if they need to pay in installments for some reason, then they will be responsible for that cost separately. And because that cost can be upwards of $300, a lot of times people say, you know what, I'll save that money and go ahead and pay um, in advance. And so in our billing through my case, we just put it under expenses and we take it out of the retainer that we pay for them. Um, mm -hmm. When we have things such as mediation, I do let clients know, and it is in my contract as well, that those costs, they're responsible for those costs. So the filing fee, the service fee, um, we will pay, but the other fees the client is responsible for, and that is laid out in the contract. And that is, um, I'm glad I asked that question because that is uncommon. Um, well, not not that it's uncommon. I don't... Um, I don't bear the cost of third party fees, even if my retainer is paid up front. But those are the mm -hmm. questions that you want to ask and be clear of with your attorney when you sit down and have your consultations. That's uh, great information, ladies. So let's go back to some of these questions. Miss um, Garner, she is a Maryland attorney. She she chimed in. She said she also bills hourly. She uh, is a domestic attorney in Maryland and also bills hourly. But she also mentioned that she knows a lot of family law attorneys who are moving to flat the billing, um, but she hasn't done so at this point. And it's interesting that she mentions that because I too have spoken to uh, several colleagues who uh, are considering moving to flat fee billing, even on issues that are contested. Um, so how do you all feel about this this wave, this movement towards um, flat fee, even in contesting contested matters um, with domestic uh, law? Ms. Johnson. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. You know, I, I've, been, I've been a little weary of it, to be honest, um, just because I think that you never really know how a case is going to play out. And it's so... I put it like this. To me, it's a catch-22 because oftentimes when we get retainers up front, people pay those retainers up front and then it is like pulling teeth to get them to um, renew their retainer. But the benefit of it is you can get out of the case. Like you you don't replenish your retainer, then I'm withdrawing from the case. And you can either figure it out or hire somebody new. Okay, great. So that kind of makes things a little easier. Um, my fear, I think with the flat fee is that either number one, I won't charge enough and I'll begin to feel apathetic and frustrated because I'm doing over and above and feeling like I'm not being compensated for it. Or on the flip side, I'll charge a good bit of money 
and we sell it pretty quickly. And the people, the person feels like, you know, they didn't get their money's worth. Um, so that is always something that is fearful to me. I have been seeing many of the conversations about it. And I see a lot of attorneys say, well, you kind of flat fee in blocks, right? And I've seen that it's kind of like up to this point is this cost. And then should it be this is this cost, which is similar to a retainer um, to some extent, but you know, it's very clear and laid out. Have I taken the time to kind of flesh through that and figure that out? No. I, I also think that I'm a little afraid of how the clients may respond because with a retainer, sometimes you can start with maybe a smaller retainer and you know, the more work that I do, the more money we're going to make from it um, as time goes on. But people can kind of take small bites. When people see a big number up front, sometimes it just, it just turns them off. So I just have a a few fears. I, I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> I'm on so I think many of us share in the in those fears. Um, I think it's it's scary to try to project on each case how much it'll cost, because as we said earlier, litigants will drive the cost of divorce. Um, so to set a fee, not knowing, uh, you know, because someone can come in your office one way and six months later, they're a different. <laughs> <person>. <laughs> mm-hmm. <Yes. laughs> So now you're committed to this fee and a lot more than you projected or in the alternative, like you said, a lot less. Um, Miss Garner again said, I'm curious about doing flat fee billing for family law matters. However, you would need to collect a large amount. And most times clients don't have that amount to pay. And and that's right. So you want to be covered. So you have to, you know, consider client issues down the road and and all the considerations or or factors that increase and you have to kind of charge that on the front end not knowing if that's going to happen or not so i agree with you um there this uh kenya brown says she wish she had this information or this advice years ago um i it's 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 i'm glad that you made that comment on here because this show i've I've had the idea of doing a legal talk show in my head for years. And this is exactly why I had this idea. But I was just too fearful of doing it, putting yourself out there, um, talking and and being live is a scary thing. So I thank you for um, mentioning that it, this uh, this information is helpful and you wish you had a, a year ago or years ago, because it is, it's, it's, um, I think it's needed. The conversation is needed. There's so many topics to talk about for us to get out there to the public, um, to make the public um, more knowledgeable. We have another question from Ms. Tia Parker Gaiman, and I'm sorry, it's taken me so long to ask it. Uh, Her question is, is there a base or starting price for legal separation or divorce? We'll start there. Do one of you ladies want to take that? Well, actually, I'll start with her second part of that question because it varies because each situation is different because that's the answer. Okay. Yes, it varies because each situation is different. Um, I, I guess, yes, there is a base price, um, you know, depending on the attorney that we start at, um, either for contested or uncontested divorces, but it does vary based on the situation because if you come to me and you have children and you have a lot of property, property. to divide, mm-hmm. you have debt, then that base price is going to be different than if it's just you and your husband and no property to divide, but you, it's still a contested divorce. So the quick and easy answer to that is yes. It it does um, depend on the situation and it does vary. There's a base price depending on situation, but even that varies because it just depends on if you have what the issues are as far as the divorce is concerned. And that's the same for me. And it's certainly the same uh, for me. Um, and, and that's why it's important when you sit down and have your consultation with the attorney um, to, to ask that question, you know, what do you bill hourly? Do you bill um, a flat fee? We lost Jabrina there. I'm going to mm-hmm. add you back into the stream, viewers. I apologize again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Um, and it's important to ask those questions so that you you know. I think that um, the situation, whether or not they have um, 
parties have children, marital property, whether or not they have retirement accounts, um, mm -hmm. whether or not there's going to be post-divorce matters to uh, address. All of these factors are taken into consideration when you um, discuss retainers. But I will make this distinction. For, for my firm, um, there's an initial retainer. So when you say base price, I am thinking, and maybe Jabrina, uh, Jabrina and Jamie, you're thinking the same thing. Your base price is an initial retainer. And that means that although that is where you start, that is required to be replenished in the event that you exhaust that retainer. So a base price is, is going to vary. And even then it's going to increase if that uh, base price or initial retainer, if you will, is exhausted. And if I may, I think that's why it's so important to have consultations um, prior to um, having a client to retain you. Because, for instance, I don't think sometimes people really understand what is going to go into a case. So oftentimes I have to explain to a client it's going to be more expensive if we're fighting for primary custody. You know, if we're having a fight for primary custody, likely we're going to need a guardian ad litem in the case that adds a whole new realm of work. Um, options. As you stated, Melanie, um, even when we're thinking about issues such as uh, what happens post-divorce. So let's just say it's a child support case. And after it's over, we have to prepare the paperwork that goes to the Office of Child Support Services so that the money starts coming out um, automatically or, you know, through income deduction. So sometimes people don't understand that there's more than just go to court. Um, I actually had someone call me yesterday for a consult and I had to explain it may be an emergency to you. I can't guarantee you that the court's going to feel like it's an emergency during these uncertain times. Um, but I have to charge, you know, based on the consideration that, hey, we may have to get up and, and go into court. We may have to file something in person. But also I had to kind of go into a deeper explanation about the pros and cons. And hey, if this happens, then X or if Y happens, then <laughs> Z. Um, so they could understand when the price comes, okay, this is not just, um, just for her to show up in court because I would be the second attorney in this case. And the matter was filed in February. They had a court date scheduled for March and she thought it was a final. And it's a whole custody modification. I'm like, that wasn't a final, right. but obviously it just wasn't explained well. And so if someone's coming and asking you for thousands of dollars and you think we can get in court in a month, you're going to probably be put off. So consultations are super important so that everybody's on the same page. Thanks for that, uh, Jabrina. Um, and I think we all agree that the consultation is our opportunity to set the groundwork, right? Uh, make sure that the client understands what the process is uh, and what they should expect, which is why uh, viewers, most many family law attorneys charge for consultations. You are um, sitting with us and we are sharing our um, information, legal expertise with you. So we charge the consultation. Um, many of us do. Do you two charge for consultations? Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and so that that is why, because that's a question that comes to me often is, um, well, some attorneys consultations are free. Well, and that's nice. Um, <laughs> mine is not. <laughs> <laughs> Many of my colleagues, we charge for a consultation because we're working. We are yes. working. So I, I had explained to my clients, if I sat here and talked to everybody for free um, all day, then I would. I wouldn't be able to keep my lights on right. because my voice is my service. My knowledge is my service. So if I provided free consult, if I did four or five free consultations a day, then how am I going to feed my family? That's very yeah. true, Jamie. And that was my conundrum because I would probably say at least for the first eight or nine years of my practice, I thought that was such a huge selling point that I would have free 30 minute or free one hour consultations. And what I found was that I was giving away all of this good game, as they say, all of this good knowledge for free. Mm -hmm. And uh, people were taking that knowledge and either represent themselves or they were going and hire an attorney that may not cost as much money. And like you said, I'm not 
getting work done on my other cases because Mm -hmm. I'm sitting down and taking an hour, sometimes more than an hour to speak to someone and and not receiving any compensation for it. And so um, I had to change that policy and it was hard for me. And I still think my consultation fees are kind of low compared to some of my colleagues. But um, I did understand the importance of having the charge. We that's that's what we do. We we have the knowledge and we have the information and our consultations are super informative. Like we're going to mm-hmm. give you a lot of information. So I haven't had anyone that felt like, oh, I want my money back. Everyone's felt Absolutely. like, okay, you know, I definitely got a lot of information. So a yes yeah. for me. And that's that's when you are you, you feel rewarded in um, in what you do. Um, and that you charge because yes, I'm going to make sure that this consultation is valuable, um, that you, you know, receive what you paid for. Uh, I have another question from Ms. Gaiman. If a client decides to work things out with the spouse and decides not to move forward with the legal separation after you have started a case, is the fee refundable? These are great questions, Ms. Gaiman. <laughs> Would one of you like to take that <laughs> response? That's going to depend on the attorney, how much work they've done in your case, um, what the contract says. So that is also going to, the answer is going to vary depending on what, what stage that happens at. If it's at the very beginning of your case, then you might be entitled to some of your funds back. But typically, even from the beginning, the attorney has already put in work. They've opened your file, which, as you both know, even just opening a file takes work because we have to build it into our system. We have to have our um, whoever our staff, administrative staff is, open up that case. Um, sometimes we've already done some preliminary research. Um, so that is just going to depend on how much work has already been put into your case and at what stage that happens. Up. I my contract says non-refundable. Um, my, my fees are non-refundable, but it, it just depends on where I am in the case. How about you, Jabrina? So um, I agree with Jamie um, and I have been planning to change my contract to say that my fees are non-refundable. Um, but I do in my current contract have that $500 of my fees are non-refundable. And it is exactly for what Jamie just laid out. I mean, oftentimes we're doing some research just to make sure, okay, can I file this with this? Or is this the right count? You know, sometimes um, we may need to kind of figure some things out on the front end. So you're doing research. You're already, as Jamie said, opening up the file, which takes time, putting it into the system. There there are costs that are associated. So at least my first $500, that retainer, that part of the retainer is non-refundable. Um, but I think you have to be realistic. If somebody comes in and you have only done a petition, but you haven't done any discovery or anything like that. And they pay you $3,500. I mean, to me, I think you get the money for the value for the work that you've done, but I just don't they get their money back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, in my conscience, I wouldn't just keep someone's money. Like I, I well, just, and the bar yeah. says that we can, I okay. mean, let's, you know, we're hard to, we're also held to that standard that we can't keep money that we haven't earned. Right. So um, we would, be required to refund that money. And that's another thing that makes me worry about the flat fees because you just don't know what's going to happen. And so somebody has paid your flat fee. You think you're good. You've done X, Y, and Z. And then here comes something. And now it's like, okay, but that's not refundable. And how do I determine if I did or Mm -hmm. it's just, I think it gets confusing. So, yeah. And that's probably another, uh, another show because there isn't the ethics portion of that, that we always have to be mindful of our, you know, rules of professional responsibility. Um, There is some case law that says though, once we um, start a case, of course, um, even if we've done just a little bit of work, um, we don't have to refund the remaining funds because we conflict out. We can't represent the other party. There's nothing that we can do. Our hands are tied. So we've almost lost money if Mm -hmm. we, um, because of the conflict now, you cannot be retained by the other party. Um, So, and and I did not know that we were going to touch on that topic. So I don't have that case, but that is definitely uh, a big issue. But for me, my retainer says 
the, my funds are uh, non-refundable. However, if I haven't started your case, I don't care that I've conflicted out on the other side. I'm ret I generally um, refund that money without I, I reinforce to the person, I explain to them that I don't have to per the engagement letter, but I know ethically and per the bar, that person deserves their money back. Um, mm -hmm. But if I started it like the two of you ladies, if I started your case, open the case, um, I've done research, I've started a draft of the petition, um, then that is a different conversation, a different thought process for me. But at all times, mm -hmm. I try to be reasonable. Above the, I just want to be reasonable because that, again, is the expectation that I have of my clients in representing them. I right. want you to be reasonable. <laughs> I want you to be fair. I want you to be reasonable. And so I have to conduct myself that way. I was just raised like that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I had a uh, Keisha also wait on that. Again, Keisha is the Merrill. Merrill I go to my boss, my Merlin attorney. <laughs> <laughs> so Miss Garner, she said, I think ethically the attorney could charge for the work already performed, but should return the unearned amount that remains in the trust account. Listen, that I, I think that makes you sleep better at night, you know? Yes. It makes you sleep better. Um, so I do have two other, I'm going to read, uh, we have a comment by Miss Brown. I'm going to reserve that for last, but I had two other topics that I wanted to discuss and we'll have to go through those fairly quickly. I wanted this to be a 30 minute show, but it got so interesting. Um, my next question or the next topic was about legal separation. Ladies, do um, I had a call the other day. Um, the person wanted to follow legal separation. I said, listen, I have you exhausted, you know, everything, marital counseling with the church, speaking with somebody, all the resources available to try to preserve your marriage. Um, and she said she had, and it was just over. She didn't want to remain married. Um, and then, so my thing for, for, for litigants in Georgia, then why not just file a divorce? The same thing that we're going to do for legal separation is what we're going to have to do for divorce. You're going to pay me the same amount of money. You still got to pay the court costs. And if you have children, you still got to go through um, those uh, channels. So why not just file a divorce if you believe that your marriage is at the has run its course? Um, what do you all say about uh, filing a formal divorce versus filing a legal separation? What do you say to your clients? So for me, um, I say the exact same thing that you said, but I have had two cases where it made more sense to file a legal separation. And both of those cases related to health insurance benefits. And we mm -hmm. all know, you know, from, I guess you say year to year, president to president, we don't know what the health um, insurance um, situation is going to be. And so I've had clients that have had maybe like some type of terminal illness and there was no way that they could work or no way that they would be able to secure their own insurance and no way that they would be able to pay COBRA um, for the type of ailments that they had. And so they wanted to address custody, address child support, address marital assets, debts, that kind of thing, but they needed to stay legally married to stay on the insurance. So I have had that situation, but I normally will tell people, unless it's something really unique like that, you're just wasting your time. If you don't know if you want to actually get divorced tonight, you should probably do counseling before you go and spend all of this money. That's just my thought. And I tell people that when they sit down with me. I mean, obviously, this is the business that we're in. But I also I come from a two parent household. Parents have been married over 55 years. Listen, I believe in divorce. So you have to make sure before you hire me. Make sure you've gone through all those um, resources that are available to people. Um, to make sure that they have tried everything before you give up because it's only you're only going to lose money too if you haven't done that and then you're backpedaling in the litigation right. um so yes that's something i definitely um talk about with my clients uh J jamie how are you um with well, i always tell people that the only difference between a legal separation and a divorce is at the end you're not divorced so <laughs> 
Um, sometimes I have had people come to me though for religious reasons. They can't Ooh. get a divorce. So um, I've done a few legal separations because they can't, or uh, you know, their religion doesn't allow for divorce, but they still need to resolve some of the issues that come up with divorce. So I have um, handled legal separations in those cases because, of course, as we know, you go through the same process with a legal separation in Georgia. That you do with the divorce so we can still do all of the discovery we can still decide who's going to get the house who's going to do this who's going to do that and in cases where your religion doesn't allow for divorce and it allows you to resolve those issues but still technically say you're married great point and unlike i, I said that we had a maryland attorney who is um commenting on our case out uh, here's a distinction in maryland you do have to be separated for a year i know there's some uh exceptions to that uh but in Georgia, you do not have to be legally separated for any period of time prior to filing a divorce. But in some states like Maryland, I believe California, and I don't want to speak on their law, but there are some states that require the parties to be separated for some time period prior to the filing of a divorce. There was- No, and I think in Texas, you have to be separated a certain amount of time as well. Jabrina, oh. you're from- um, Mississippi, do you know whether or not you have to be legally separated in? I don't. I hate to put you on the spot. <laughs> I know, right? Um, so now I never practiced there. I don't know if you have to be legally separated, but I know it's very different because here we have no fault, and there the only way you can do no fault is if it's uncontested and you agree on everything. Otherwise, I do know that you have to file a fault divorce and you have to have the the proof or whatever that fault is. And I know that there is a process while it is pending. Um, I think here we call it kind of like year support or something. But there's a process by where, or maybe I'm wrong. I, I'm not 100% sure. But I know there. Yeah, year support is a probate issue. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> see, all right. Get, get me together. That's but I know there, um, I've had people say that while things are kind of going on, if it is a, what they call at fault, that you have to still like maintain the household so like mm. a husband will still have to pay the bills and and that kind of thing it's it's much different i tell people all the time i cannot talk to you about it in mississippi because here if one person wants a divorce the divorce is going to happen it's going to happen <laughs> i love when the judges say that to my clients hey when they it's happening. This is happening. Yeah. <laughs> I have another question. Um, I was under the impression that you had to be legally separated for one year before being able to uh, divorce. Is that not true? Miss um, Gaiman, you are in another state. Um, so you will have to check with the family law in your state. Uh, Miss Gaiman is in South Carolina. I cannot speak on South Carolina's requirements. I don't think either um, of you ladies would be knowledgeable about South Carolina's law. Um, it varies from state to state, um, Ms. Gaiman. So I would recommend you speak with an attorney in your particular um, state because we do not, I do not know. And Melanie, I'm sorry, but I have to know. I have another appointment coming up. So I am sorry to leave you ladies. But it has been a wonderful time and I hope to join your show again in the future. Thank you Bye, so Jamie. much, Jamie. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. And Jabrina, mm -hmm. um, it's just the two of us on here now. The only other topic I wanted to cover, um, if you have just a minute. Oh, sure. Just to talk about marital property. That's something I just had a call the other day. Um, is the house that we live in marital property? Um, he was living in it you know, five years before I moved in and we got married. <laughs> well, um, why don't you take it and tell, explain what marital property is for the viewers? Okay. So um, that, I, that would probably be premarital property, um, but it is very likely that it turns into mixed property, which ends up being marital property as well. Um, so oftentimes we will have a situation like that, but we do have case law that says that, you know, should there be something done in furtherance um, of this appearing to be or the intention to be marital property, then it can convert from a premarital asset to a marital asset or marital property. And examples of that could be anything from adding a person to the deed afterwards, after you've gotten married, 
um, refinancing and putting them on the mortgage. Um, there could be, say, for instance, if a wife had the house beforehand, the husband comes in and he adds a new garage and, you know, a pergola in the back and, you know, a new deck, um, then he has made improvements to that property. And so to think that you can simply walk away um, with 100 percent of the equity in that property when there have been improvements made or just because it was yours beforehand, but now this person's now in the deed, now that you all are married, um, I think would be a mistake for, for anyone to to make. So right, to think that, that would happen. And again, it goes back to people just be reasonable um, with your with your mindset and how you think that this will um, pan out, but also seek the advice of an experienced family law attorney so that you understand your rights. I will say in general, marital property is anything that you acquire after the date of the marriage. And that right. does not just mean and is not just limited to assets. It right. is also debt. Yes. Um, so people want to take the good, but they don't want to take the bad. Always. Listen, <laughs> Always. Marital property is everything that you acquire after the date of the marriage. And as um, Jabrina stated, there's sometimes that what is or what was premarital property can be converted or there's an argument to be made that it should be considered marital property property. So um, is there anything else about marital property just with this last minute or so that you want to add, Jabrina? No, I think you um, I think you put it together. You're right that we generally in Georgia define it as anything acquired after the parties are married. But you have to be really careful um, with that. And you have to be reasonable. If, if, like I said, if you had a house five years before you married, but you guys lived in it for 20 years, you cannot think that a judge is not going to think that a person did absolutely nothing to benefit this home um, that would entitle them to some something from it. Or people have to understand, uh, oftentimes courts are there to be equitable courts. So while that may be your premarital property, okay, they can't get the 20 years of um, of uh, mortgage payments that they made into it. But if you have some retirement, they may get a larger sum of your retirement to offset that. To offset so it, if right. people come to the table and they're just reasonable on the front end, we don't have to fight, um, to me, those unnecessary fights. Those unnecessary fights that will undoubtedly increase the cost of your divorce, right? So <laughs> yes. there are no winners in divorce. Um, yeah. It's just not. So um, we circle right back to that. So we have covered today the cost of divorce, legal separation, and briefly touched on marital property. Jabrina, I'm so sorry you had the... Um, <laughs> technical difficulties in the beginning, but we finally got your beautiful visual um, after a minute. Thank you so much for joining me. I Thank appreciate Thank you it. for having me. I really appreciate it. I love doing this. This is fun. <laughs> well, then we will do it again. I okay. want to thank the viewers. Thank the question. Thank you for uh, the questions in the comments. This is Wait One Legal Minute. We're going to keep doing this and keep bringing the information um, to litigants and colleagues and just use this as a form to share information. Thank you, viewers. Thank you, Jabrina. Thank you, Jamie. I know you're not here anymore, but thank you for joining. I appreciate you. Have a All good right. one. Be safe. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.